Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 510 of Screw the Commute podcast. Today, we're going to do an Ask Me a product production question. Last episode was Ask Me a Video question. So we're going to be doing a lot of these, and I'll be doing more product production, website questions, all kinds of stuff in the future. It does not mean we're not doing interviews anymore. It's just when I'm super busy, I can knock one of these out very quickly and not have to deal with editing two people and setting it up and doing all that stuff. And I'm happy to do all that stuff, but uh, right now is an extremely busy period. So I figured, how can I help the people as fast as possible? And this is uh, how we're doing these Ask Me a Question episodes. And I got to tell you, this can mean fortunes to you. I mean, these I've been making products, oh my God, long before the internet was around. And it's meant millions and millions and millions of dollars. And the non-internet related products, some have been selling for 28 years before the internet, the commercial internet started. All right. So this is my philosophy called work, get paid, 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 and paid some more. See, because most people's work model is go to work, get paid, go to work, get paid. Go to work, hope the company doesn't go out of business and so you can get paid. <laughs> All right, so, so in this case, you work on a product and then it can sell for years and years and years. And I mean, I still have some internet products that sell uh, multi-years, but and, and a lot of them are digital now, so they're easy to update so they can keep selling for more years. Perfect example is one of my books, Kickstart Viral. So I I don't know, I wrote that three, four years ago. And then I just go in and update it if some of the software has changed or something and put a new copyright on it. And boom, boom, boom. I got, you know, within a couple hours, I have an updated, fully updated product. See, so that's what we're talking about. Product production so that you work and then you can sell the stuff over and over and over. And if I don't understand why more people can't get this concept. (laughs) Right, because they just want to get up, take a shower, feed the dogs, get the kids to school, go to work, slave away, listen to some idiot telling them what to do, uh, be surrounded by a bunch of worthless slugs that that, that uh, don't care about the quality of their work. I know I'm giving a poor attitude to this, but it's so prevalent out there. It's very rare when you see people that are really doing a great job at work and no matter. And I did that when I was, uh, uh, you know, I had a couple jobs cutting grass and things, but I always went overboard to do a great job, even if it wasn't my, you know, doing it for my yard. See, so I don't want you to do that. I want you to get it in your head that you can make products. Information products are the best, not novels and fiction. Yes, you can make money with that. You know, ask J.K. Rowling, all right? But that's one in a, a, a hundred billion that makes it that kind of way. So so information how-to products are very, very simple to create. And you don't have to be a 50-year expert to make a product on something. You can research it, try out the methods, and compile research from other people that have actually done it and you know, so, and I'm not uh, a person that wants to, you to hold yourself out as an expert if you haven't done something for a long time and are really great at it. But that's a different story than creating an information product where you go to sources that have done it, put them all together, and you're kind of like the publisher. And so you can do all kinds of things with these things. And it gets, and one thing all products should do is lead to something bigger. You know, so if I write a book, I want it to lead to a sale of something else, an online program or a mentor, my mentor program or somebody signing up for my school. So 
these can lead, these can really change your entire life if you buckle down and do it. If you just, or, you know, if you're just a slug and you just go to work and come home and you just uh, watch TV all night, well, there you go. That's what's, that's what, that's your fate, all right? But it doesn't have to be that way because the tools are so easy now to use and so cheap and free, and uh, your computer is just massively powerful. Okay, so let me get off my soapbox here and hit you in the head with some of this stuff. But, but uh, the first thing I want you to do is go grab my automation book because one of the things, if you are going to work now and you want to get out of it, you need to be able to work faster on your, your internet or your online business, see? Uh, so this book that I've been giving away for hundreds of episodes here will make you work faster. And I tell people, you're just crazy. You're just crazy, lazy, stupid if you don't use these things. And I'm not saying my book is the end-all, be-all, but it kind of is, right? And it's free, so you're kind of ridiculous if you don't download the darn thing and look at it and say, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And now you, all of a sudden you're working way faster. You're not uh, sitting at the computer as long just by taking the time to learn a few of these things. So go download the darn book and use it at screwthecommute.com slash automate free. Screwthecommute.com slash automate free. And while you're at it, get a copy of our podcast app at screwthecommute.com slash app. That's A-P-P. We give you, teach you how to use it screen captures and videos and all kinds of ways to use it so you can have us with you on the road. I mean, there's literally over a million dollars worth of training in the episodes of this, and that's not even counting the interviews that I've done. So there's out of 500, and this is 510, I think, so uh, 160, 170 of those are training episodes free <laughs> all right so you've got mi a mil over a million dollars worth of training there if the, if i was teaching you this stuff one-on-one -on -one or if you're in my mentor program so if you don't take advantage of it you know <laughs> i don't know what you're doing all right now i want your help on this pilot program i'm doing with uh, persons with disabilities they are uh really really inspirational people that are in the program we're going to uh, get them trained with internet and digital marketing. We're going to get them hired or in their own business. And then we are going to go for grants and foundations and corporations to finance a big rollout of this after I prove the concept. See, it's if you just go begging for money, that's one thing. But if you go begging and show people, look, this is what I've been able to do to help these people change their lives and get them off. Uh, I'm, I'm not specifically talking about the people that we're talking about uh, that are in the program, but I'm saying for many people disabled or on welfare rolls and wish they could get off, but don't know what, what to do and how to do it. So I want to help tons of those people be productive and increase their self-esteem and reduce the suicide rate and reduce the unemployment rate. So you can help out with this. So Go to my school site, imtcva.org. That's Internet Marketing Training Center, Virginia.org, imtcva.org, and uh, forward slash disabilities. And then click on the GoFundMe campaign, and you'll see videos of these people that uh, two of them are blind and doing Internet stuff. Can you believe it? I couldn't believe it either when they first signed up. I'm like, oh, man. I didn't know. I was thinking people that were on crutches or something or didn't have any legs. But uh, these people are, are in it and uh, in it to win it, put it that way. So check it out. Okay, so let's get to the main event. So I compile questions that are related in these Ask Me a Questions. And some of the earlier ones, I just did a potpourri, and I'll still do that. But in this case, it's all product production related. All right, so the first one is, Tom, everybody tells me to write a book and you have written many. What's your method? Okay, well, the first thing I always do and the way I teach my mentees is you start with the PDF version because there's no cost involved. There's a high profit. You know, they're 97% profit. They can be changed on a dime. You probably already have everything for free that you need to do it, which is 
a word processor, either in a Mac or a PC, the ability to convert to PDF, which you can, they're free. I mean, if you, know, you can do Adobe, but you got to pay for that. And to make the cover art or any graphics, you got things like Canva and iPicky, that's I-P-I-C-C-I.com, or Y, I-P-I-C-C-Y.com. So the risk is extremely low. And, and another thing, you know, when you make a book, the first version is never, ever, ever, ever perfect. I mean, they may never get perfect, but you always, after you finally see it and put it out there, you say, ah, darn, I forgot to say this. Or some reader will say, hey, why didn't you talk about this? And you say, oh, man, I forgot that. And so if it's a printed book, you've got enormous amounts of work. I'm going to get into printed books here in a minute to fix it up. Where with an, uh, an ebook, you go back to the Word document, let's say, make the changes, change the table of contents a little bit, reconvert it to PDF, and boom, 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 you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're back in business with no expense and no delays and no trouble and no wishing, you know, trying to get rid of old versions of the book because they're, they, they're not in your garage in a box. They're just, you know, it's just the electrons on your computer. So I always start them with the PDF version. And then to further decrease the risk and increase the sales, then we convert it to Amazon Kindle. We don't bother with Barnes & Noble, Nook, uh, any of the Apple things, nothing. There's nobody competing even close. And the thing is, you say, well, what's the difference? Why shouldn't I just throw it on all these other? Well, Amazon is smart, and they have this deal where if you swear or if you make a contract with them that you won't sell the book anywhere else, uh, that's a 90-day contract. It's not forever. All right? If you make a contract, say you won't sell the book anywhere else, they will give it away for free for five out of those 90 days. And you say, well, what good is that? Well, earlier I told you the book should always lead to something bigger. So they gave away five, no, 2,500 copies of one of my eBooks in five, five days. And each eBook leads people to something that makes me $600 per year, per person, <laughs> right? So I started getting thousands of dollars extra a month because of Amazon's power. So do you think I want to trade that to get, to get one sale every three months from Barnes & Noble or something? No, I don't. So uh, don't bother with anything. And it's totally free. Amazon has Kindle Create software. I did a whole ebook 12-week uh, mastermind, and we'll be doing another one here soon. So uh, watch for that on your email. Make sure you're, if you see, if you get that automate free book, you'll be on my email list and you'll get notice of these training sessions. Um, so then uh, that's the two things we do. And so um, that's, all, that's all I'm going to talk about for pr producing, um, you know, a book. And it just put things in logical order, like whatever you know how to do or you can research how to do. Put it in logical order. How-to books are so easy. See, I don't have the mind to write a fiction book where you have plot and character development and twists and turns. No. This stuff is, I mean, that's far beyond my, my intelligence level. Uh, the how-to stuff, though, you can just crank it out till the cows come home because uh, it's logical and people want to know how to do stuff. So, um, so there you go on that. Now, if you do want to then go to the printed version, all right, it's a whole different ball game. All right, you got the text mostly written, but here's the thing. When you go to the printed version, now I'm not talking about going for a major publisher. That's a whole thing that I just think is a nightmare, worthless. Uh, I won't even bother getting into the, the, the hassles of that. And unless you're a super celebrity, you're not going to get any kind of advance that's worth it. They're going to, uh, you know, require you to sell so many books and, you know, there's just all kinds of things. And like, for instance, when I went with a major publisher, I got a big advance, but that was years ago and they nickeled and dimed me. They made me pay for the graphics. They made me pay for indexing the book. They, uh, 
and it was 18 months from the time I gave him the manuscript till the book came out on internet topic. Well, it was obsolete. It was partially obsolete before it even hit the shelf. You know, so so uh, anyway, uh, one thing that you absolutely must do is I I, I absolutely re I'm saying require. I don't know if you do it or you don't. It's your problem. But you should buy two different books. One is the the last version of the self publishing man. Manual by Dan Pointer, P O Y N T E R. He's deceased, but I mean, there's been 20 editions at least. So get the la latest one. And then the uh, 1001 Ways to Market Your Book by John Kramer, K R E M E R. So the, the first one is going to be your total blueprint on how to self publish a book. See, I want you to self publish because that's where the big money is. You can go to what they call a vanity publisher who will uh, take their time and make a cover for you. And they'll take their time and give you an ISBN number. And they'll take their time and they'll edit it. You know, so you're paying a lot of money for that service. And then, and some of them are total ripoffs. In fact, I did an episode uh, with Dan uh, Janal, J-A-N-A-L, on his podcast. And we my whole the whole episode was about uh, publishing ripoffs. So get out of that. Just, you know, save up the money to get a, a cover. And you can now, and when I say save up the money in my ebook mastermind, nobody paid for covers. There's beautiful templates, hundreds and hundreds of them on Canva. So they just made them on Canva with a tiny bit of training for free. And they're all gorgeous. In fact, we have a, uh, a page on our uh, on the screw the commute. I'll get the the thing for the uh, the show notes. I can't remember the the address to it right this moment, but um, all these covers that were made by people for free and they're gorgeous and they sell their eBooks. So anyway, you can make a cover yourself, but remember you got a front cover, back cover, and a spine, so it's a little bit different. Uh, you have barcode if you want the book to be in retail stores. You have ISBN numbers, which, uh, you know, to be in many of the stores you have to have. And you got you have to decide whether I want an ISBN or not. See, if you're going to be selling them at back-of-the-room speaking engagements, you may not even need or care about an ISBN. One thing you got to worry about ISBN is if your sales aren't that great, Everybody in the publishing in industry knows about it because they can go look up your ISBN and see how many copies you sold. So, and you could have sold 10,000 in the first month at the back of the room at, a spe at speaking engagements, but that doesn't show up in their system. So, you got to be, uh, you have to just decide whether you want an ISBN or not. Then you got to, you know, you can do the whole lay out the book in Microsoft Word, but Microsoft Word is not a typesetting machine. And it's going to look a little bit, you know, chintzy if you just do it in Microsoft Word. So then you're going to look up typesetting. And I remember the last time I did it, which was a long time, it was $4 a page for typesetting on a six by nine book. And you have to decide what size is it going to be? Six by nine, five and a half by eight and a half, is it going to be eight and a half by 11, like a workbook? You know, you got to decide all these things. But anyway, all of these details are laid out in, in beautif beautifully in the Dan Pointer book. I got his first copy of that book, I don't know, 30 years ago or more. And his influence is in all my products now. So, And then the, uh, the uh, 1001 Ways to Market Your Book. You know, all these ways in this book uh, apply to all these products. So so a lot of uh, John Kramer's stuff is influenced in my stuff. So anyway, much more difficult to print a book. And now you have print on demand, which you can go through Amazon and uh, KDP program, Kindle Direct Publishing, is what you'll do your, your uh, Kindle book and convert it to a uh, print on demand. Or you can go to a major publish or a major book printer, which they're getting, you know, more <laughs> few and far between. And in that case, uh, Dan Pointer in his book tells you how to make a bid. And I do have to tell you, send the bid that's going to see when you go to a commercial book printer. 
the book is going to look exactly the same no matter who you, which one you send it to. The paper is going to be exactly the spec. The colors are going to be exact. See, there, it's a whole different animal than print on demand. So what you do is you, you make up a bid sheet of all the paper that you want and the colors and this and that. And then you send it out to at least 30 commercial book printers. And you'll be amazed at the difference in the bids because some of them might be hurting. Some, maybe they got a load of paper that somebody didn't pick up or complete their book they want to get rid of. Who knows? But, you know, for the my Wake Em Up business presentations book, the bids were from $11,000 to $36,000 and for the same exact book. That was for... 5,000 copies, I might add. So guess what? I took the 11,000. <laughs> and guess what? Again, there's some cool tricks. I pre-sold 1,000 of them for 7 bucks a piece and got $7,000 to put towards the print bill. So I only paid $4,000 for 4,000 copies for a twenty four ninety five book. Now, that's a pretty darn good markup. I only paid a dollar each and sold them for twenty four ninety five. And I could discount them and give them away at speaking engagements at twelve ninety five, and still make ten dollars, eleven dollars a book. So that's a whole thing on deals you can make when you when you're selling products at the back of the room. Okay, but anyway, there's some information on uh, printed book. All right, Tom, how do you make an online course? Well, whenever you're going to do an online course, I'm going to highly suggest that you make it what we call multimedia. That means it's got video, audio, and print because you don't want to just put out just a video course and then people that drive for work or, you know, in their car all day, they're never going to buy it because they can't watch it. They can't consume it. But if you put out a video course and then you took the audio track off the video and made an MP3 they could put on their cell phone. And then if you had it transcribed cheaply, which is cheap nowadays, so that they could, the people that like to read could follow up and watch the video, listen to the audio in the car maybe, and then follow up and read the details. Or, You know, the one the thing about videos, they're nice, but a lot of times people don't want to watch the whole video to find this one thing that they were interested in. So they can quickly go through a PDF file and find the piece of information they were looking for. Sometimes you put the timestamp on the PDF file, which takes them back to the part of the video that covered that. I mean, that's another nice little feature you could throw in. So online courses probably should be locked away. Now, have I done some that aren't locked? That's right, I have. It was just too much trouble, and I need to get it out fast for some reason. I don't, you know, some of these I don't remember. I've done so many of them. So I just put it on what's called a hidden page. So nobody knows the address to the page, the URL, unless they bought it and the shopping cart gave it to them. But there's no lock or no, no anything on it. Now, could somebody find it and steal the course? Yes. So that's the downside. But it's fairly inexpensive to lock off the pages. We use WordPress. And it's basically, you got a membership site. So, for instance, Copywriting 901 would be an example of this, which is a lifetime membership. And it's basically a WordPress website with a wish list member plugin, which we got affiliate links for that if you wouldn't mind buying through our affiliate link. And then just email me for that if you want. And then a couple other little plugins to make it all automated. And then people pay in the shopping cart. And then that unlocks the pages where your videos are. Okay? So that's uh, how you make an online course. And then um, if, you know, if you're a little camera shy, uh, you don't even have, your face doesn't even have to be on the video. You don't even have to have a good hair day. You can simply use screen capture video. And I've been using screen capture for now almost 22 years. Started in the year 2000 with uh, Camtasia is the gold standard. There's others, but that's the gold standard. And I just put stuff on the screen, like I might be training you on how to use a piece of software. So I put it on the screen, and then 
my microphone picks up my voice telling you where to click and what to do and how to use it. And uh, a big yellow ball shows up under my cursor. That's one of the things people mess up on screen capture video. They, people can't follow you because they can't see the cursor very well. So mine, the cursor lights up yellow, and if I click, there's a, it flashes red. You know, so it's very uh, user-friendly to the person watching. And they never see my face. They just hear my voice, and they see the, the, the uh, software. And the software is not mine because I don't make software. It's driving them through an affiliate link to go buy the software if they liked what I showed them, see? So that's screen capture video. And so uh, most of the copywriting course, uh, the, the main thing was screen capture video, again, with audio files and again with PDF files to back up the audio, excuse me, to back up the video of things, but it's all screen capture. It's, you don't see me. I'm showing you examples of subject lines and, and scribbles and, and uh, just, uh, you know, email sales letters and small sales letters and all the kinds of things that's made millions of dollars for me over time. That's at copywriting901.com. Okay, so that's uh, making an online course. Okay, audio products. Well, the first thing is you got to have good audio. People don't, you know, they're, they're used to hearing high-quality audio. Their earbuds are better now. Their headphones are better. Their speakers on their computers are better. So you don't want a schlocky audio. So you have to have a decent microphone, and we recommend a dynamic microphone. That's a type of microphone. It's not a brand because it's not so sensitive. And you think, well, I should have a good sensitive mic. No, you shouldn't. Not if you're recording at home because it'll pick up everything that you don't want it to pick up. So I'm using a good quality dynamic microphone right now, and I'm doing other things to knock out the noise and the recording environment and things like that are important. I've got plenty of episodes uh, telling you about that. But I write out a script, but here's the thing. I'm extremely experienced in reading where it doesn't sound like I'm reading. I mean, I go all the way back. I've had my SAG after card from doing commercials and taking training uh, with the Screen Actors Guild teleprompter and all that stuff. So I'm extremely, because if you're not good at that or extremely good at that, it looks like you're reading or sounds like you're reading, and that is just terrible. All right, so so if if you're not extremely experienced and not willing to practice, then just put bullet points in a logical order and talk, all right? And remember, for audio, they can't see you. So you can have as many notes as you want. But here's the thing. Don't shuffle the papers around in between uh, reading them and uh, you know, because that gets on the recording. So at the end of one page of notes, let's say, or your script, just stop talking. Change your page and then start talking after there's no movement and no paper sounds anymore because this is going to be edited out later. But if you're shuffling the papers while you're talking, you can't edit that out easily or at all sometimes. Now, audio editing is way easier than video editing. Uh, there's some, uh, the Audacity is free for either Mac or PC. Hey, that's, that isn't, poetic it's pathetic <laughs> you have soundforge is another well-known one i use adobe audition and a super fancy one is pro tools i don't use that you can learn how to do this in fact i always say this because it's just so funny it sticks in my mind the guy that taught me mike stewart the internet audio guy is an old country boy from uh georgia and so he says tom if you want to edit audio First thing you got to do is record something. <laughs> and, then he, and then he said, and then you cut out what's bad and what's left is good. <laughs> That's all it is. With a half hour, I could teach you how to edit as good as me. All right, but I've edited all 510 versions of this. Uh, well, I haven't edited this one yet because it's not finished, but... 509 versions of the podcast I've edited 
and I'm super fast at it after you, uh, you know, after you do do it a little bit, you get really fast at it. Then you, you know, you go back to where you were changing pages in your script and there's a gap there of nothingness. You just highlight it, hit delete, and it's, it disappears like it was never there. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's so easy to audio edit nowadays. Now I'll give you some techniques to make it even easier. One technique you can use, now this isn't for live things that I'm doing like a live interview on a podcast or something, but I could do it on this one very easily because it's just me. One technique that I learned years ago is that if I make a mistake, I snap my fingers like this. And then I know, and it makes a really sharp thing on the audio editing software. So I can see, oh, there's a, <laughs> there's a mistake right there. So I can go right to it, and I know the mistake was right before the click. I mean, I'm not anticipating my clicks and clicking before I make the mistake, all right? So right at the click, right behind it is the mistake. So I listen to it, I highlight it, and delete it like it never happened. It's so, so cool. And then I, I never try to fix a word right in the middle of a sentence. So if I make a mistake, I click my fingers, that shows the, uh, where the mistake was, and then I start that sentence over again. And I can go right through, and then I, when I go to edit it, I can see the mistakes, boom, 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 and go and fix them really quick, all right? Some people use a dog training clicker if they're not good at snapping their fingers, but snapping your fingers, you know, is easy. Now, one of the things you think you should keep in mind on audio products is you probably should put a, an extra level of detail in because, remember, there's no visuals to go along with it. That's one of the problems with taking the audio track off of the video when you're doing a multimedia thing is that a lot of times you, you know, they're seeing something so you don't put much detail into it because they can see it on the screen. Well, I'm, I'm changing my tune on that, especially since we're doing so much work with blind people that can't see it. Even if they can hear the video, they can't see it. So I'm starting to put more levels of detail in things. So you want to keep that in mind. And then you always record at the highest quality. On a PC, it's a .wav file, W-A-V. On a Mac, I think it's a .AIFF file. And then you reduce it to MP3 which is the standard everybody uses. But here's the thing that people don't understand. MP3 is a variable quality. It can go from super high quality where nobody but the, the audio engineer can tell the difference from the, the WAV file down to so bad it sounds like static. <laughs> All right. So you have to learn about uh, what quality you want to distribute at. And I don't want to get in the weeds here with kilobits per second and all that stuff, but that's uh, it's very easy. And once you set uh, uh, make it uh, the record at the highest quality wave, and then when you're all done, it's all edited, you're all happy with it, then you save a copy as MP3. And once you set your your audio software, it'll just be that way every time. You just set it once and that's it. So when you uh, export it to mp3 it's in the proper format boom 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 there you go and see the mp3 the reason you do it is it's way smaller file size it's called compressed and you can make it cd quality or like i said really pitiful quality it depends on uh, if you're selling it or if it's just some training stuff where you just you don't want uh, big files clogging up your computer and stuff that's a little bit on audio files now, before I tell you about video products, I want to just remind you about the, uh, the pilot program we're doing with the folks with disabilities. You know, they say no good deed goes unpunished, right? <laughs> so when I came up with this idea to help these people, I, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, people with mobility, they, they're in wheelchairs or they have problems with their hands or stuff like that. First two people that applied were blind, <laughs> right? So... So I said, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do now? So they helped me and we got it together where they are progressing through the school even though they are blind. And we're improving our websites uh, 
accessibility in which everybody needs to do that now because a lot of lawsuits are coming with that. So you need do need to pay attention with, with that. But but uh, this is I'm just so proud of this program. Uh, we have a GoFundMe campaign. We'd love for your help. Any little bit helps. And uh, hey, if you're flush with cash, you could sponsor an entire uh, person yourself. And uh, check it out at imtcva.org forward slash disabilities, and we'll have that in the show notes. Okay, let's get into video products. Well, see, video has much, much, much more complexity because you have both the sound and the picture to deal with. And it's not just twice the complexity. I, I say it's like 10 times the complexity. Now, like I said earlier, if you're camera shy, uh, you can use screen capture video and, and make video products. I mean, my first video product had 50 screen capture videos on it. Sold for, it was a CD-ROM, sold for $199. And sold them like crazy. Sold, uh, sold $7,000 worth the first week. So yeah, it's, it's very powerful when you're teaching people and they can actually see what you're doing and hear what you're doing. Now, here's the thing about a video products that you're going to have, uh, you know, it's kind of like the online course I was talking to you about earlier, but here's the thing. If you try to use shared hosting, which I've got episodes about hosting, uh, you know, fairly cheap shared hosting and put these video files on, which are very big. Okay. They're really big. And by the way, MP4 is the standard. Now it used to be uh, .flv and .mov. The standard now for distribution is .mp4. And so if you try to put these still, they're going to be gigantic files, really gigantic. Your website's going to take forever to load People are going to be mad. The things are going to uh, stutter and stop and, you know, you got to wait for them to go. Yeah, you know, it's just nothing, nothing is going to be good about this. So what do you do about it? You say, well, I just saw them on uh, YouTube. Well, you could do that, but that's not the best practice because YouTube always makes it easy to go back to YouTube. And we don't want them. Once we get them to our website, we want them to consume our product or promotional video, whatever it is. I mean, and not that we don't love YouTube. We love it to grab people and get them over to our site, but once they're on our site, we want to keep them there. So the, the best practice is where you house the video file on a service like Amazon S3. Amazon has all these other services that they have for people, and it is dirt, dirt, dirt cheap, super cheap. So you have this Amazon S3 account. And if you have an Amazon account, it's just another service you can log into. So, so get an Amazon S3 account. Another uh, place people use is Vimeo, but Amazon S3 is even cheaper, is, is way, way cheaper. And then you put a video player on your website. And the video player is connected to Amazon S3. Now, the visitor that's watching the video has no idea where it's hosted or could care less. It just plays. It plays. It doesn't stutter. It's beautiful. Your website still loads as fast as it should load because you're not bogging it down with these giant files. So that's the best practice. And then, of course, you lock it behind a membership software, which I told you earlier. Now, Video editing is, like I said, is 10 times more complex than audio editing. And yes, I can do some. I have Adobe Premiere on my computer, which is a pretty sophisticated program, but I can only do certain little things. If it is anything important or, or the least bit difficult, I turn it over to Mark, my video guy. Now, one thing about video, you say, oh, I got to have good video. Well, guess what? The audio is more important than the video. People will put up with poor video, but they will not put up with poor audio. If they cannot hear it, they're going to shut it down. They're not going to watch it. Now, I'm not telling you not to have good video. I'm just telling you that you've got to pay attention to your audio. Uh, and the cell phone is fine for this if you're really close to it when you're talking. 
But as soon as you get far away, you should you should find a wireless microphone that's compatible with your phone. And iPhones have had trouble with this. So I suggest you you look on Amazon, find one that swears it's compatible with your iPhone, buy it, and if it doesn't work, return it. And I have done that two or three times, I got to tell you. So you got to have good audio. Now, you, you will have better control over your product if you shoot indoors. You don't have wind. You don't have stray dogs running around. You can control the lighting. But if you must shoot outdoors because that's your stick, well, you got to be able to deal with wind, sun. You know, and you say sun. Well, sun creates harsh shadows, which look terrible. It makes you squint. It makes you sweat. You know, so you, how do you do with that? Well, come to our VIP video weekend. You'll learn all of this stuff and more on the shooting on location and in the studio and everything. We'll put a link to that in the show notes for you. So you got all kinds of noises. And here's something I'll bet you never thought about. A lot of places you have to have permission to shoot if it's used in a, 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 a for-profit production. So, for instance, you can't just go out to Sedona, Arizona and all those beautiful red rocks and just shoot a video production, right? If they catch you, <laughs> you're going to get sued. you got to get permission and pay a, a fee uh, for doing that kind of stuff. So, so uh, keep that in mind. One trick that I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, because we, we do a session on how to make a $50,000 video about you and your, your business, is... If you're in any kind of reasonably sized metropolis or city, see if you have a Convention and Visitors Bureau. That's a, called a CVB. Because in my, I have one video production that's brought in, the last estimate was like $13 million. <laughs> All right, we cost $3,000 to produce. And so one of the, the techniques I teach in doing that is that the Convention and Visitors Bureau, their whole mandate and your tax dollars go to them promoting your area to bring in conventions and business and visitors, Convention and Visitors Bureau, right? So they have video footage of your whole city, all the amenities of your city that's yours for free for the asking. I mean, many of them might charge you a little duplication fee, you know, and there's more footage than you'd ever need in a million years. So maybe you pick what you want and they have to make a copy for you. There could be a little fee for that. But we got aerial footage of Virginia Beach and shopping footage and airport foot, uh, just all this stuff for free that went into my production. See, so that's a good trick for you. So uh, we'll do more product production episodes in the future. Keep those cards and letters coming. <laughs> Yeah, email cards and letters coming. <laughs> Don't send me a letter. <laughs> I guess you could send me a letter. We'll do more of these ask me a question things, but we're, we'll get back to our interviews here when I can breathe a little bit. You know, it slows down on the holidays enough that I can uh, book some book some people in and we'll get some more interviews going. But these uh, hopefully these are highly informative for you and help you in your business. Check out the, uh, the GoFundMe campaign. Hey, if you'd like, uh, my help for a year with our very unique and popular mentor program. Check it out at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. I get a kick out of doing this and helping you and hearing from you and how uh, my trainings have have uh, done good for you. So, so there you go. All right, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. We'll catch you on the next episode. See you later.